in the previous lecture we discussed that the quantum transport refers to the manifestation of quantum mechanical properties of charge carriers especially electrons and holes in transport properties and we also concluded saying that this quantum transport generally refers to the transport through low dimensional systems or mesoscopic systems where the quantum confinement effect on the electrons are apparent. So before we dwell into the details of quantum transport, let us quickly revisit the classical transport okay and uh, in that framework of classical transport let us make incre incremental progress incremental changes to various parameters various terminologies various quantities and we will treat the transport on various low dimensional systems one by one okay so in this lecture we will look into the classical transport briefly, then the Fermi Dirac distribution and density of states. So first let us look what do we deal with or what kind of mechanism we deal with when we this when we uh, discuss classical transport. Here the electrons are treated as the molecules of an ideal gas and the the statistics that these particles or these electrons obey are Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. So, what we have is an MB statistics. So, what I have here is a representative system. The blue colored region is the system and the yellow color regions are the contacts where you apply voltage and measure currents through. Okay. So in the premise of uh, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, what we have is we have a we have a box which is which represents the solid and there are a lot of um, scattering centers in the solid there could be scattering um, between those electrons so scattering with some other you know scattering centers such as impurities or I mean whatsoever but but that those details are not really relevant here the point here is these electrons undergo motion very similar to the ideal gas molecule it undergo collision and it will move from one end to the other end by the application of electric field with an average velocity Vd, that is a drift velocity. So the way it is defined is if you look at this plot here, every collision, every event of collision will reset the momentum of these electrons to zero. So in one case electron will go to a certain distance and come back to zero this is the velocity and this is the time axis here then maybe next time it will go further distance and undergo a collision and come back to zero so each of this drop here refers to a collision and the electron velocity is reset back to zero 
So you will have a distribution of time between two collisions, this delta t1, delta t2, and so on, delta tn. And this mean or, or the average of the time is something which we call the collision time or scattering time. That is the mean time between two collisions. And correspondingly, there is an average value for the velocity for the electrons through the system that we define as drift velocity or VD. Okay. So you have a you have a number of electrons and number of scattering events. So the statistics works pretty accurate here. So what you have is you have certain velocity and average velocity by which the electrons move through the system. And the whole process is dominated by scattering or collisions. Okay, and tau here is the mean collision time. Now you can build on to this framework and you can say that the momentum is basically h bar into delta k but delta k is nothing but the wave vector that has been built or that has been accumulated after one collision that is nothing but depends upon the force into the delta t that is the time after the collision okay so over delta t time there is a force f that is f is e into e okay and but average delta t is tau so what that means is this momentum average momentum each electron has is something like minus e e tau that's what it is and this velocity attained is p by m that is e e tau by m okay and from this you can calculate the current density which is charge density into velocity that is n into e into vd where ne is the charge density n is the number of electrons per unit volume vd is the velocity and that is going to give you n e square tau by m e is our sigma is the conductivity this is your ohm's law okay this is nothing but the ohm's law That's what this is. This is another statement of Holmes. The usual statement that you know is V is equal to I into R. That's the usual statement. So that is a simple statement. And this is the statement which you get from the by treating the transport as classical uh, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. Okay, and this model is actually called the root model or root picture. Okay, now in this uh, in this case, what we have done is we have considered that there is a connection which is made by the source electrode and the drain electrode. There's a source electrode here and there's a drain electrode here, and the electrons are actually moving through the system okay but now there are a lot of interesting but crucial details that we have actually swept under the carpet in this case so there are a few points that you need to consider one is which is very very important to consider one is electrons are quantum mechanical entities so this uh, maxwell boltzmann statistics is something which you cannot apply all the time because those are electrons are fermions and you need to apply fermi Dirac statistics okay secondly you basically assumed that just by connecting a source and drain leads the material the electrons will freely flow from the source to drain but there are few other factors that are crucial or that one need to consider when we look at this transport number one what is the nature of this interface okay this is not like a simple you know barrier free or resistance free interface whenever you mix whenever you join two different materials so so two dissimilar dissimilar solids 
you always will have some kind of impedance or some kind of barrier, some kind of resistance and the behavior of the resistance as a function of the applied voltage is also, also varies from situation to situation, okay, that we have not considered. Secondly, if you look at the microscopic picture of the electrical transport, what happens is you have an electron which is going from the source, which is the material, then that electron eventually will go back to the drain. Okay. So, source and drain are basically huge collections of material which actually can accept or emit, uh, emit or accept respectively indefinitely with any number of electrons. Okay. So, what that means is, and uh, and the material, what in this case the blue region here, need to have space for the electrons to go. When I say space, if you look at the whole thing, I have a person here in terms of energy axis. Okay, here it is this axis energy. This is a physical space. This is this is a physical dimension, but here height here represents energy. So when you apply a source strain voltage. What you are going to have is you you are going to apply uh, you are going to tilt the whole potential or energy landscape in this in this um, picture. So what you are going to have is you have a small slope here. Okay. Now the point here is you need to have electrons available in this region. You need to have space for the electrons available here to collect those electrons. Okay. And you should have space here. When I say space, it's all refers to space in the energy space or in the energy, energy axis. There should be space or states available here, states, that is the term, okay. Here also everything refers to state, states, here also what I am saying is state. So there should be electrons available here. There should be states available here and there should be states available here for those electrons to traverse through. All these plus this region in the middle should not basically pose a lot huge resistance or non-trivial behavior for the transport for the transport. So all these things are very very crucial for us. So let us now try to understand the role of each of these and how we can factor in these details into our basic framework of classical transport. That is what we will do next. Okay. Now, let us look into the quantum mechanical treatment of the electrons, which is the free electron theory in its most primitive form, which is an incremental change to the Drude's theory. Here we are treating the electrons similar to the particles in a box problem in the quantum mechanics. We know that the wave vectors for a particle in a box, in a three-dimensional box as shown here are given by kx is 2 pi nx by l and similarly for ky and also for kz okay where this nx ny and nz are quantum numbers the total energy is h bar square k square 2 m it is only the kinetic energy, there is no potential energy because the assumption is the potential energy inside the box is zero. Where the k square is given by kx square, uh, ky square and kz square. And you can note here that this is actually an equation for a sphere for a spherical surface with a radius given by k and uh, this sphere in the k space which represent 
the k states of electrons inside the material inside the solid is called fermi sphere and uh, the the volume occupied by the states in the fermi sphere is basically given by 2 pi by l in each direction so that will be 2 pi by l cube that will be the volume of a volume of a state now the total number of states in the fermi sphere is given by the volume of the sphere divided by the volume per state that is 4 pi 4 by 3 pi kf cube divided by 8 pi q by l cube that is the total number of states inside the fermi sphere and if there are n electrons in the system okay if there are n electrons in the system then the total number of states that would be occupied or that or that in the fermi sphere inside the fermi sphere will be n by 2 because in this case we have not considered the spin dependency so every state every k state can actually take two electrons so if you account for that two factor you will know you can know that the total number of electrons in the system is given by kf cube lq divided by 3 pi square and where kf is the radius of the fermi sphere where kf is also the highest occupied state that is the kf in the fermi sphere so the radius of the fermi sphere is kf which is given by this expression 3 pi square n by l cube 1 by to the 1 third or 3 pi square ns where ns is the concentration or or the electron density of the system okay to the power 1 third so the radius the, the radius of the fermi sphere is given by kf that is called the fermi wave vector okay that is the fermi sphere is called the fermi wave vector and uh, the energy of that state with the wave vector kf is called fermi energy all right so this is the overview of the simplest most simplest treatment of most simplest quantum mechanical treatment treatment of electrons in the solid okay now we got an expression for the number of states in the fermi sphere and the highest occupied state now the transport the electron transport through the system also depend upon whether there are states available inside the material so even if you try to inject or try to transport electrons through the system but you also need to make sure that there are states available at that energy so the action of you putting an electron in the system in transport in practice is you apply a voltage between the source and drain that sets the energy scale and the question now is are there states in the material so that electron can go through those states to the drain side from the source side so that is defined by a quantity called density of state it is nothing but the number of states per unit energy per unit volume number of states per unit energy per unit volume that is called density of state and that is given by the expression de this quantity here accounts for, for the unit volume 
and dn by de here that is the number of states per unit energy and this is for unit volume and from our previous view graph previous slide we have expression for n and uh, this you can use this k of that wave vector and convert that into energy units and you can write this n in terms of the energy okay using this expression now all you need to do is you need to take the derivative of n with respect to energy and divide by the volume okay so then this l cube term will cancel out and you will get eventually the expression for the density of states and this is for a three dimensional solid so that is why you put l cube here for a two dimensional solid you will replace this l by 2 for a one dimensional system you will replace it by 1 okay and correspondingly there will be changes in the the fermi wave vector also that also you need to consider so what we are saying here is the density of states for a three dimensional system is is proportional to e to the power one third or square root of e square root of energy okay so this curve here represent the density of state as a function of energy for a three dimension solid similarly you can also get expression for the density of states in reduced dimension which is the reduced dimension transport through reduced reduced dimension is our topic of discussion throughout this course okay so for a three dimensional system we know that it is it goes like square root of e or it is given by this um, curve there for example i have a picture here of graphite so as an example this is a three dimensional system graphite for a two dimensional solid by substituting appropriate right kf and the right volume in the previous derivation we can get that this density of states actually a constant for every subband this these represent different subbands so inside each subband it is actually constant for example you can feel a sheet of carbon atoms from this uh, three dimensional graphite that is called graphene there are a lot of other examples also semiconductor heterostructures quantum level systems a lot of there are many many examples for two dimensional systems interface between two materials okay these are all two dimensional systems and in 2d it is actually a constant in 1d for example a carbon nanotube carbon nanotube cnt or nanowire it is proportional 1 by square root of e or the density of state which is given by this spiky structure there and that goes like 1 by square root of e and for quasi zero dimension such as quantum dots or nano conducting nanoparticles that goes like delta function delta of e and that is given by this features or this delta functions there for example the c60 molecule is actually a quasi zero dimension system quantum dots quantum dots or nanoparticles these are all examples of three dimensional system the three dimensional confinement or zero dimensional system so and um, this for these confined systems we know that the density of state actually is actually has different dependence on e so density of state is one of the main main quantity which controls transport or main parameter which controls transport through the system and uh, you can see that as you change the dimension of the solid the density of state changes and the trans behavior of transport also will change which you will see when we discuss transport through all these two dimensional one dimensional zero dimensional uh, systems as we progress as we make progress in this course all right now there is a small detail there is one small detail which we need to discuss this is also something which most of you guys have actually 
done in one of the previous courses such as solid state physics or statistical mechanics. That is the occupational or occupational probability. So here what I have drawn is a two-dimensional Fermi surface or a two-dimensional system. In 2D you will get a Fermi circle or Fermi uh, you know sorry it's not a Fermi sphere it's a Fermi circle and uh, and kf is the Fermi wave vector and the Fermi Dirac statistics that is what the electrons as quantum mechanical entity as fermions follow instead of instead of the Maxwell Boltzmann statistics which is what the true theory assumed okay so these Fermi Dirac statistics or the Fermi Dirac function or Fermi distribution function which is given by this equation there that is going to tell you what is the probability that certain state is empty or that certain state is occupied okay and that probability also changes with temperature for example here this is the energy axis okay this energy goes like this or that is same as saying energy axis is energy increases as you go from the center of the fermi sphere to outwards in this direction energy will increase and at zero temperature at absolute zero the state until the surface of the fermi sphere that will be filled with a probability one this red curve the red trace represent that or the blue trace here represent that and every state above the energy of ef or the fermi energy will be unoccupied will be available for transport okay so as you change the temperature this step function is going to get smoother and softer and this is going to develop a width which is a, which i have represented here this is going to develop a width where the some of the states within a energy width of 4 kbt that is the width of the fermi function that is approximate width of the fermi function that will be available within that window will be available for transport that is a temperature broadening which i have represented here by the black curve where the blue trace here represents the picture at zero temperature and and above zero temperature or when the temperature is not zero this blue trace will get softened and or here the red trace will get softened and that will develop a width to the distribution to the sharp cutoff for the probability and the states within that energy window around the Fermi sphere will be available for transport and <clears throat> this Fermi energy if you look at what is that what is the what is the quantity or what is the magnitude of the Fermi energy that is approximately equal to the ionization energy of the solid because these electrons are free from their parent atom in the solid because they are ionized so you can think that the freely moving electron those are the electrons on the surface of the fermi sphere and those are those are the electrons which got free from the parent atom in the constituent solid so the energy of those electrons should be comparable to in principle it should be comparable to the ionization energy of the solid so if you look at that will be like 10 electron volt in that order i'm not saying it's an accurate number but in that order 10 electron volt because you know that the ionization energy of hydrogen 
atom is 13.6 electron volt that we know so what i am trying to say here is the fermi energy is of the order of tens of close to say 10 electron volt and the width which is 4 kbt if we look at the room temperature that approximately correspond to 100 milli electron volt because kbt at room temperature is 25 milli electron volt room temperature correspond to 25 milli electron volt we can multiply the Boltzmann's constant the temperature in Kelvin scale that will give you 25 milli electron volt so the width of the Fermi distribution is 100 milli electron volt approximately that is the broadening of the Fermi distribution but the Fermi energy which is actually a very very large number it is more than 10 electron volt it's a huge number it's a large quantity compared to the width so what you can say here is the electrons which are available for transport those are the electrons on the surface of the Fermi sphere within the width of 4 kbt at a temperature t that width is comparatively very very small compared uh, with uh, compared to the overall energy or Fermi energy of the solid which is 10 electron volt whereas this is only 100 milli electron volt so reasonable temperature whether it's room temperature or even slightly higher temperature the softening of this um, the fermi surface is not really appreciable that contributes only like a small fraction of the overall dimension of the fermi sphere that is what i am trying to say here all right Now, we have now went through the basic elements of uh, transport and let me summarize here what are the things we discussed. So this is our candidate system for transport where we have source and drain, okay. There is a source side and there is a drain side and there is the material here. But what we have not considered in this discussion when we when we uh, look to the classical treatment or Drude's theorem or Drude's treatment or Ohm's law is number one the available availability availability of electrons on the source side. that is given by the Fermi distribution of the source side okay and uh, secondly the availability of states availability of states in the system that is nothing but a density of states d of e okay and three whether there are states available on the drain side so this is the source side this is the drain side source side drain side so we need to look at two factors number one are there electrons available here are there empty states available for available here for these electrons to go and sit on the drain side and are there states available here that is the density of states inside system for the electrons to go through for the electrons to traverse through and if there are states what is their behavior as a function of the energy and that also we discussed in the previous slide where this 
as a function of energy, the density of states shows different behavior depending upon the dimensionality of the system. Okay. So, the third thing what we are saying here is availability of states on the drain. That is 1 by f of e. 1 minus, sorry, 1 minus f of e. Okay. Because f of e is the probability of state being full and 1 minus f of e is the probability that a state being empty. So, there should be an empty state on the drain side for this electron to go and there should be a state which is full here for the electrons to start from and there should be a state which is empty here that is given by 1 by 1 minus f of e on the drain side and there should be states available here for the electrons to traverse through. So, these three things need to Man, these three things need to satisfy. This is the states available on the drain side, states or number of states available in the system, and the electrons available or the charge carriers available on the source side. And another small thing, it's not a small thing, it's actually a very crucial thing, but which we have not discussed is the behavior of this interface. So generally the leads which we refer as source or drain here those are metals and the system usually would be some other phase such as semiconductor or semi metal or superconductor something else. So, what is the nature of the interface? That is something which we need to worry about. Nature of the interface. That is also an important aspect. That is an important, very important aspect. So, what we will do now is we will look these features in detail for various dimensions and in the next session we will start with the the fourth one the nature of the interface between the leads which injects or takes electron out of the system and the system that is the focus of our discussion for the next couple of lectures. All right.